Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out. Let's get our Bibles open this morning to Luke chapter 12. Not yet. Luke chapter 12. And we'll be looking at the first 12 verses this morning. Luke 12, verse 1. And Lord, we want to thank you for this beautiful day you've given to us. Thank you, Lord. We have a, a cool place to come in out of the heat or a warm place to come in out of the cold. And you provided a comfortable place where we can come and study your word. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be here to speak to each and every person, Lord. And I pray today if there's anybody here that doesn't know you and has not invited you into their heart as of yet, that today would be the day they'd make that decision. We pray for this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Just as I was beginning to to teach for service, a thought came to my mind about when my kids were little. Well, actually, they weren't little. They were teenagers, and they were graduating from high school. And they had these ideas of what they were going to do with their life after that. And as a parent, you're concerned about those decisions. I'm still concerned about the decisions my kids make, and they're in their 30s now. But I imagine Jesus here, these are the last weeks of his life, and he's concerned about whether his disciples are really going to adhere to the teachings that he's given them. When he's speaking here to this Pharisee, to the scribes, and to the religious leaders that are all there in this Pharisee's house, and every one of them were filled with hypocrisy, and they were doing things that God would not approve of. And so here, this picture we pick up today, I want you to have that in the back of your mind, that we're weeks away from the cross. And Jesus here is wanting to really ingrain into the minds of his disciples to not be like these Pharisees, the scribes, and the lawyers who were the religious interpreters of the law of Moses. So keep that in mind. Now, we left off last time with the Lord being invited into this Pharisee's home for dinner. Of course, it turned ugly when the Lord began to correct all these various religious leaders. He would begin by saying to them, Woe unto you, Pharisees! Woe unto you, scribes! Woe unto you, lawyers! Because they knew what they were supposed to teach, and yet they weren't living it themselves. And so now, today, we turn our attention to uh, the outside of the house as we're told that these religious leaders are kind of ganging up on the Lord now. Now, when you're confronted in a sin, you really have two decisions. You can either rebel against the correction or you can humble yourself, right? And so here he's sharing with these religious leaders what's going on here that is not hidden and that he knew what was happening, and yet they attack him. So while this is going on, we pick up in verse 1. It says, In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, so pay attention here, these are important things. These are last words that he's sharing with his disciples that we need to pay attention to. He says, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark is going to be heard in the light. And whatever you've spoken in the ear, in the inner rooms, is going to be proclaimed on the housetops. Now understand, it was common during the time of Christ that people who were not invited to be part of a dinner, they were allowed to go into an inner court area and stand and listen to the conversations that might be going on around the table. <laughs> Excuse me. Also, they had the windows open and people could hear what was happening from outside. Well, while the Lord is rebuking these religious leaders, I wonder how many people are thinking, finally, someone 
finally someone's going after these guys. I've been thinking this all along, but didn't have the guts to do it. And they're watching this happen. And so the Lord warns them. And apparently this large amount of people, they were trampling each other. Now the Lord gives his disciples a warning about the perils of growing popular, of being successful, to not be like the religious leaders. It's so easy when you're around somebody else who misuses their power to influence you to also misuse your power. And so he warns them not to be like this. Beware, he says, of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Because nothing covered is not going to be revealed. That's something for us to understand today. Let me tell you. You may have some secret kind of sin going on, and you might be able to keep it from people around you. But it will be revealed. And you may have a secret that nobody around you knows, but God knows. There's no secret kept from the Lord. And there's a danger to watch out for when things seem to be going well in your life or ministry to be tempted for yourself to become a hypocrite. Did you know, they talk about little white lies, people who begin to tell little white lies become colorblind. And the lies change and they're no longer little white lies. They're now gray lies. And they become to where it's such a habit in your life, you don't even know how to tell the truth anymore. My dad used to say, there are people who will crawl up on top of a ladder to tell a lie rather than stay on the ground and tell the truth. And it's true. There are people who go out of their way to tell lies rather than just tell you the truth. Maybe their life is boring. They want to spice it up some, so they'll make up some story so it sounds interesting. But whatever it is, it may start off simple, but it becomes very complicated in a short period of time. Now, the word hypocrisy, it comes from a Greek word, hypocrisis, and it refers to actors in the Greek theater who would speak from behind a mask pretending to be the character that they're playing. So if you have a character that has to be sad and they're, they're talking behind the mask in this sad tone, then they would put a mask up to their face showing the sadness. And if it's happy, they'll grab a mask to show happiness. If they're confused, they have masks that look confused. I want you to look at this for a moment. These are some masks that they would use at that time that they found. You see the various uh, images here. Smiling, yelling, uh, surprised, angry. This is the type of masks that they would use as they would act out the, their scenes. And so they weren't as refined as the actors are today. And so instead of an actor being good at expressing their feelings as an actor needs to be able to do today, they would simply hold up this mask over their face. So the essence of hypocrisy is trying to to appear to be something that you're not. It's speaking from behind the shroud or this mask. So Jesus likens this mask-wearing mentality to leaven because although it seems insignificant in the beginning, it becomes, well, like leaven, it puffs up. It comes in and it gets involved in every part of your life. So the art of being a hypocrite depends on concealment. But the Bible tells us here, Jesus tells us here, but one day all is going to be revealed. We can only be a hypocrite before men, but never before God. God sees behind that mask. Now, leaven is a yeast. Actually, they used it in the baking of their bread. You need just a little bit of leaven, you put it in the lump, and as people who are bakers here, you know that it causes it then to puff up, the bread to uh, grow uh, to where they want it to be. So this lump will begin to ferment by just a little piece of leaven. Just a little leaven is all you need to affect the whole lump. And that's exactly what Paul uses as a visual example. He was a visual teacher also. And so he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 6, he says, Your glorying 
is not good. Now, this is a church that was using all the gifts of the Spirit, and he commended them for that. But he says, now you're getting puffed up, and you're glorying, which is not good. In other words, you're thinking you're something special. He says, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, his conclusion is, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened. What does that mean? There's leaven, picture it as being sin. Well, now that you're a Christian, there's no sin in your life. You've been purged of that. You're unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, he says, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice, or wickedness, but rather with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Christ has set us free from our sins. He's given us his righteousness, so don't abuse that. Rather, take that righteousness and use it and, and uh, be a holy person in order to walk with the Lord properly. So picture leaven as sin. It amazes how hypocrisy can spread with just a little bit of it. You let it get into your life, and it begins to grow in other areas. The next thing you know, your whole life is turned upside down with lies. It has the effect of rotting and spreading. So Jesus here is warning his disciples, and I believe that goes further than the disciples. I think he's speaking to everybody around there that's listening that wants to follow after the Lord. Today, if you want to follow after the Lord, get rid of the leaven in your life. God sees it. You're not surprising anybody. You're not going to stand before me on Judgment Day. Oh, I got him fooled. He thinks I'm really a strong Christian because I carry my Bible and I smile at him when I come into church and say, Hallelujah, I know all the words to the songs. You might have someone here fooled, but you're not fooling the Lord. And you do not know when that last day of your life will be required of you. And at that point, it's too late then. So he's warning them. And he tells them there's nothing covered that will not be revealed nor hidden that's not going to be known. In 1985, there was a nationally known evangelist. I'm not going to mention his name, but he was a preacher. And he wrote a book and in this book, he condemned sin in America, especially sexual sin and pornography. And just a short time later, he appears on TV weeping, tearful confessions of years of involvement in the very sins that he wrote this book about. And he promised repentance. But he was arrested for similar crimes just a few years later down the road. His repentance either wasn't real to begin with, or if it was, it wasn't a deep enough repentance to cause him to not do it again. His hypocrisy surprised many people, but not God. God knew it all along that he was doing this. Now, why did the Lord allow him to get caught and, and to be so embarrassed and humiliated? Not because he wanted to, to punish this man, but God's goal was for him to repent he had an opportunity, being in the national scene and the national stage, he could have repented and been such a wonderful example of what the Lord can do in a person's life that's trapped in a sin. And yet he chose not to go with that, and the Lord allowed him to get caught for, to break this man, to humble the man, because it's better for him to be crushed now than to spend eternity in hell later. And so he says, I say to you, verse 4, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, even has the power to cast you into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Now there's a connection here between Jesus and what he had just said and what he is now saying. The Lord knew already that hypocrites will always despise and come against the faithful. Isn't that the truth? 
You try to stand up for the Lord. You try to live a righteous life. And you're always going to be attacked by those hypocrites. They've always got something to come against you on. It blew my mind that there are websites that actually came against Calvary Chapel, the Calvary Chapel movement, and particularly Pastor Chuck. And so anything they could dig up, any kind of rumor that they heard, anything, whether it was true or not, they would put it on, on uh, Facebook and put it on the Internet for everybody to see, hoping that they can catch him. You think God is pleased with someone that does that? Sin sniffing? Going after other people? I wonder what sins they have in their life that they wouldn't want revealed. But this would become a trial that each one of these disciples were going to have to face. They would always have somebody who would come against them, somebody who would come against the Christianity they represented. And sure enough, it wasn't long after the Lord's resurrection that the disciples began to experience that heavy persecution. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, in the first 300 years of Christianity, there were hundreds of thousands of Christians who were put to death for their faith. One researcher has documented that since the time of Christ, more than 70 million Christians have died for their faith. Imagine that. Just because you have faith in Jesus Christ, they're killing. I just saw, just moments ago, about a group known as Bokum Harem. Boko Haram in Nigeria. They're going through and wiping out whole villages, burning churches. They burned over 400 churches so far. They're raping women. They've got children being taken and they're never seen again. They don't know if they've killed them or what they're doing with these children. But there are groups that are coming against them simply because they are Christians. Statistics show that 345 Christians are killed for their faith every month. 345 on the average. 105 churches and Christian-owned buildings are burned or attacked. 219 Christians are detained or attacked without trial, being arrested, sentenced, and punished simply for being a Christian. This is going on every day. We're so fortunate that it's happened happened yet and here in America, but I do believe that day is coming. So I believe our current difficulties at Christians in America is not nearly as profound as other parts of the world where Christians are actually dying for their faith. Imagine being a man and you watch them take your whole family out and they slaughter your children right in front of you and kill your wife or rape your, your wife right in front of you and then murder you. And this is what these uh, groups are doing right now to Christians, simply because they are Christian. The mockery of our faith makes more than a few of us less likely to share what we believe. We get afraid. We're afraid of what people might say or what they might do to us. Well, I've yet to hear here in the Lancaster or the Antelope Valley anybody being arrested or beaten because they shared their faith. And yet we're afraid. Where the early church, they were much more bold than we are, willing to sacrifice their very lives if necessary. So the persecutions under the Roman emperors were aimed at getting Christians to stop, stop saying Jesus is Lord and start saying Caesar is Lord. That's what they wanted. People's worship for themselves. In the year AD 155, the persecution against Christians swept across the Roman Empire and it had come to the city of Smyrna. Now the proconsul of Smyrna swept up in the persecution, put out an order that the bishop of Smyrna, Polycarp, was to be found, arrested, and brought to the public arena for execution. Well, they found Polycarp. They brought him before the thousands of these spectators who were screaming for his blood. But the proconsul had compassion on this man. He was almost 100 years old at this point. Imagine bringing a 100-year-old man and accusing him of all of these crimes. And all these people, all these people screaming for this old man's blood. He signaled for the crowd to be silent. And Polycarp said, curse Christ and I'll let you live. 
And an amazing response, he responded and said, Eighty and six years I have served my Lord. He has done me no wrong. How dare I blasphemy the name of my king and my Lord. And with that, they burned him at the stake. That's some boldness for Christ. And we complain because a co-worker called us a name because we're a Christian. We need bold people willing to make a stand today. And Jesus said, don't worry about what they're going to do to you. And fortunately, we haven't faced that kind of persecution where we need to worry. The worst thing that's ever happened to me in sharing my faith was I was looked over for a promotion. It was given to somebody else. And I just said, well, Lord, you know what that's all about. You know what happened. You, you know why this happened. And God promoted me later in the right time and put me in the right place and promoted me further than I ever expected to go. Jesus taught us in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, and we studied this already. You are the light of the world, a city that's set on a hill. And he says, it's not to be hidden. It's not to be hidden. That's speaking to us. Don't hide the light that you're supposed to be. God put you in the positions that you're in so that you will be a light to others. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in that house. Let your light, let this speak to you today, Christian. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. It doesn't say that they may hear your preaching, but rather let them see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Oh, what a wonderful thing when somebody really lives for the Lord. They're the first ones at work, last ones to leave, do a great job, work all day long hard, and people say, you know, they're a real Christian. I've heard plenty of people say, and they say they're a Christian. I've heard those comments, haven't you? I was even talking to my secretary the other day, and I said, you know what? I, and when I see a business card and it's got a fish sticker on it, I almost don't even want to call them anymore. The bad witnesses that people are sometimes in the name of the Lord. How dare you? How dare you shame the name of Jesus Christ? Don't even put it on your car or your business card if that's how you're going to be. But rather, if you're honest and you're truthful and you truly live for the Lord, people will see that without you opening your mouth and talking it. They want to see the walk. He says, but... I will show you whom you should fear. So there is a fear, legitimate fear that we should have. Fear him who after he is killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. So Jesus is saying, look at Christian, death is not something that a believer should be worried about. What does God think about the death of a believer? Well, it tells us in Psalm 116 verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. Now imagine this. I was a draftsman and I designed, Mary and I would go uh, in our spare time, we'd go around and look at model homes and we would take things out of those homes when we were getting ready to build our home. Yeah, we like that, I like that. And we would put in bay windows. That was a brand new thing back then, bay windows. It's like nobody had a bay window. So we were all excited about having bay windows in our home. And we designed the whole house, and then I gave it to a friend that's an architect, and he did all the, the, the real work and designed the house for us. But when we first got that house built, every time we came to look at it, we were excited. I couldn't wait to bring my wife to see this house. And the day we moved in, we went and sat on the living room floor and we dedicated that house to Jesus Christ. Lord, what a beautiful home you've given us. It's yours we want to use it for your glory. And we did. We had our Bible studies in that house, and we had many neighborhood kids that would come and, and visit, and we would treat them like our own and share the Lord with them. But I picture Jesus. He says in John 14 that he goes to prepare a place for us. And if he goes to prepare a place for us, he's going to come again, and he's going to take us to where he's at. He's built a house for every one of us. Imagine that. And it's not a track home. 
you know, they got three models and then different elevations of the same home. No, no, no. And you're not going to be crammed into your neighbor, next door neighbor where you look out your window and can ask for coffee from them, borrow it from them out the window, you know, like our homes are. But God has prepared this beautiful place, a mansion for you and I. And God is anxious. The Lord is anxious for us to come to him and for him to show us our new, our new hood. <laughs> this is a new place he's provided for us. How beautiful that is, this the thought, and he's looking forward to that day. So as we grieve when we lose somebody, there's not grieving going on in heaven, but rather the Lord is welcoming that person into heaven. Oh, to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. How he longs, and it says here, how precious it is to the Lord for the death of one of his saints. So we don't need to fear dying at this end. Because that's not the end of life for the believer. In fact, that's, not, that's just the beginning of living. Our time here on this earth is short no matter how old you are. But eternity with the Lord in heaven is going to be off the charts. Now the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.8 to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So when our time comes... The Lord will take us home and his promise will then be fulfilled. We'll be with him in paradise forever. That promise is made in John 14. He's gone to prepare a place for each one of us. So in verse 5 he says, Listen, fear him who after he is killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Satan does not have any authority. He cannot make a decision of where you're going to spend eternity. God makes that decision, and only God. He's given that privilege to his son, Jesus Christ. Now, this is not some party place. A lot of people I hear, oh, man, we're going to have a, a big keg or a party down in hell, man. Cabo Wabo, and then, you know. It's not going to be on the beach in Mexico. Jimmy Buffett's not going to be playing with his band. This is how they try to picture this. But we're told that hell is an everlasting fire that's been prepared for Satan and his demons. God doesn't want people to go there. But contrary to people's thinking, it's not going to be these things. Hell is an eternal place of torment, of darkness, reserved for Satan and his demons. The Bible tells us there's going to be gnashing of teeth and complete isolation with an eternal fire. Have you ever been in utter darkness? There's some caverns out near the river we took our kids to on a field trip one time, in homeschool. And we got out there, I think Mitchell Caverns, is that right, Mary? Does that sound right? I think it's Mitchell Caverns. And you go out there, and at one point, they take you into this inner area, and they turn the lights off, and they have you stand there in utter darkness, and your eyes will never adjust to it. It's, it's complete darkness. No light whatsoever. And it gets, in the very beginning, it's kind of like, oh, this is kind of cool. And then you start thinking, turn the light back on. This is getting really scary. I don't like this. And when they turn it back on, you almost feel a sigh of breath of relief. Imagine being in utter darkness like that for eternity. It's the ultimate death, the ultimate separation from God. So don't fear what man might be able to do. Jesus says, fear the Lord who has the ability to place you in heaven or hell. Make sure that your reservation is made in heaven. I know that there is a lot in track number with my name on it. And I'm excited about that. Now he goes on and says, Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. No jokes here. <laughs> Do not fear, therefore, you are more valuable than many sparrows. So in Jesus' day, you could go to a marketplace and you could buy five little birds for two copper coins. That would be the equivalency today of about 10 bucks. Now, just yesterday, after the senior study here, 
I had to go get lunch, and then I was going to go back to the office and study for next week for sunrise service. And I pulled into a Taco Bell, and I was there, and I saw these little sparrows flying around. And I looked at them, and I thought, you know, they aren't significant birds. They don't have beautiful colors or anything. They're, they're, they're little tiny things. And you think, they really have little value, don't they? And yet God knows every one of those birds, every one of them. And you're more valuable than all these birds that he already knows the name of. He knows how many feathers are on that bird. And he's saying, I know how many hairs you even have on your head. This is an amazing thing to think about. Of course, we all know that God created the perfect head without hair. All the others he had to put hair on top of to cover up the, the ugliness. <laughs> it's been said that a redhead has about 90,000 hairs, a dark-haired person has about 120,000 hairs, and a blonde has about 145,000 hairs. I know there's a joke in there somewhere about blondes, but I don't know what it is. I'll leave it alone. But whatever the, the number, the point is, God knows all about you. He's concerned. If he's concerned about a little insignificant sparrow, he's concerned about you. He loves you. Missionary L.B. Kalman wrote, It is by no means enough to set out cheerfully with your God on any venture of faith. Tear into the smallest pieces any itinerary for your journey, which you have imagination that you might have drawn up. Nothing will fall out as you expect. Boy, amen to that. Your guide will keep you to no beaten path. He will lead you by a way such as you've never dreamed your eyes would look upon. He knows no fear, and he expects you to fear nothing while he is with you. Don't be afraid of the future because you are quite valuable to God. So God is with you. He's taken you on this venture. I think about, again, my, marrying my wife. She was born the other side of the United States. And out of all the people in the world, he brings her and she moves into a triplex and brings me, born in San Bernardino, a, a local uh, birth there, and moves me into the back apartment of the triplex and I end up marrying the girl next door. <laughs> but think about your life and your spouse and your future. Did you ever dream that you would be doing the job that you're doing right now when you were a child? Very few of us have that opportunity to fulfill that. God has led me down paths that I can't even imagine how I ever got here. And it's an amazing venture. Beyond fearing what the Lord can do to you, Jesus brings things even closer to home. He says, also I say to you in verse 8, whoever confesses me before men, him, the Son of Man, will also confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied also before the angels of God. Now there is something that I think many Christians should think about. Jesus clearly called his listeners to a choice. That's you today. Jesus is only weeks away from the cross and he's calling those who choose to follow him to stand up and to be counted. It doesn't matter if you make a confession by coming forward at an altar call. That is confessing before man. But it's beyond those doors how you live your life each day of each week. Do people know that you're a Christian? Or is that hidden? I remember the old commercial on TV. Only your hairdresser knows for sure. Remember the Lady Clairol? I, I remember it. But are you that kind of Christian? Nobody knows? You keep that a secret? This is what the Lord is saying here. If you're willing to confess me before other men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven and the angels of heaven. But if you're not, okay then I won't confess you before the angels of heaven either. So this is an important decision that you have to make. He goes on, and anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemies against the Holy Spirit, well, it will not be forgiven. 
Well, what an interesting statement. Many believers don't understand what he's even saying here. When a man blasphemies with his mouth, that is not the thing that condemns him to hell. There are people, even myself, that said terrible things about the Lord before I was a Christian. But when you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, his job is to draw you to the Lord. And when you refuse the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's work in your life, when you reject it and reject it and reject it, your heart each time is callous from that. Like playing guitar. You get calluses on your fingers from playing. And the more you reject the Lord, the more calluses you build up over your heart to a place where finally there is no conviction of the Holy Spirit. Now, praise God, none of us knows who has done that, but God does. And when that place comes, when that time comes, when you've completely hardened your heart and God knows, then he'll remove the Holy Spirit from drawing you to the Lord. And at that point, you cannot be saved. What a thought. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. Not because it's a sin too big for God to forgive, but because it's an attitude of your heart that now cares nothing, nothing for the forgiveness that Jesus Christ brings. So he says, now when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and the authorities, he says, don't worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what you ought to say. So he spoke these words to men who were going to be facing those exact, exact challenges. And we have evidence of this in the book of Acts. Peter was brought before the Sanhedrin and he didn't go and work out some kind of great discourse that he was going to say before this group of men. The Holy Spirit, we're told, gave him utterance. And what was amazing was they could not even respond to what Peter told them. They were speechless. When Paul appeared before kings and governors and even high priests, it was no worked up message that he gave. We're told that it was in the power of the Holy Spirit that he made his defense in an unanswerable way. They didn't know what to do with them. Thousands upon thousands of people since that time have faced those in power both in the city hall and in the halls of religion being challenged and receiving God's sustaining power through the Holy Spirit. Have you ever maybe had that opportunity where God just began to give you the things to say? I've had it happen in Bible study, in counseling. Oftentimes you, you think, okay, somebody's telling you something and the Lord puts a scripture on your heart. Wasn't thinking of that at the moment, but here it is. And it's a scripture that applies to their situation. The Holy Spirit gives you utterance as you need it. That's the work the Holy Spirit will do in your life. Peter, in 1 Peter 3, 15, he says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Now, notice what it says here. When I first read this, I thought I had to have an answer and a reason for everything. That's not what it says. Be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason as to why you have hope. Every one of us should have an answer for that. Why do you have hope? Why do you have hope? Why do you believe in Jesus? Why would you put your faith in that fantasy? You should have an answer for that. Know why you believe what you believe. And he says you're to do this with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you, calling you an evildoer, those who revile you can see your good conduct in Christ, and they're the ones that are ashamed. They have nothing to say about you, so they make it up. This is speaking to someone who's being persecuted. So I want to make it perfectly clear. This is to speak into a pastor or a teacher that you don't have to go and study. The Holy Spirit will give you what to say when the time comes. I actually had a pastor who came in one time and says, I oftentimes uh, haven't got any message. I don't know what the Lord wants me to say, so we just do a praise night. Well, you know what that's called? Laziness. <laughs> you need to get down and study your word. 
You can't push it off and have your worship leader uh, pick up and do what you're unable to do because you're too lazy to get in the Word of God. But this is speaking of when you are asked to give a defense, you should have one. Every one of us should know why we're a Christian. Why do you go to church? Why do you believe what you believe? The Holy Spirit will place that scripture in your mind that applies to the subject that you're addressing. Now I'm counting on the Holy Spirit speaking to me. And I'm open to sharing other stories or scriptures. So sometimes people say, your second service was very different than your first service. Well, I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit might lead me. If you have a different group of people, maybe they need to hear a different illustration or hear a different story than the one I gave first service. And I'm open to the Spirit of God doing that. The context is the same. I'm not deviating from the text, but the stories I might tell have, may have a, a different story that God wants me to share. I trust the Holy Spirit to do that in my life, and you should too. You don't always have to have a patent little answer. One time when we were at our bookstore over in, in uh, Victorville, the church had a bookstore attached to our offices. We had a guy that came in one time and he says, Hi, I am from da 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 church. And da 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 And he had this memorized script and he was like a robot. <laughs> and at the end he says, Would you like to receive Christ? And I said, We're Christians. This is a church office. <laughs> this is a Christian bookstore. Would you like to receive Christ? And of course, we didn't get very far in that conversation because he was a robot. That's all he knew. He had been trained to say these things. And I felt bad for this guy. Man, that's not a personal relationship with the Lord. You know, teach a, a robot to do these things. And so we trust in the Lord. And so it doesn't happen all the time, but I realize that different people need to hear different things. Be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Well, we're going to stop right there today. Now, I'd like to say next week we'll pick up in verse 13, but we're going to next week, of course, have Easter. I'm planning on having a special message for you, both at the sunrise service and at the two services here. So we won't jump back into this until the following week. And at that time, the Lord's going to be answering a question that someone in the crowd asked him regarding the attitude about material possessions. That should be interesting to look at. All right, let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for your word today. Thank you for blessing us. And thank you for calling us to make a stand for you, Lord. I pray that you would empower us this morning to be that light on that hill. That don't just ask us, but empower us to do that, Lord. And I pray we would all have a wonderful experience of sharing our story with somebody near us this very week. And we pray for this and for your blessing on us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.